King of the Hammers is the Super Bowl of off-road racing. It's well known as the toughest one day race in the world. Two different disciplines of off-road where we're going fast through the desert and then all of a sudden, whoo, come screeching up to a bunch of rocks the size of cars and had to boulder crawl through them. You have to have a four wheel drive, highly capable vehicle. And it's just a phenomenal event that has grown exponentially since 2009. You just can't compare it. You can't compare it to the car rally. You can't compare it to, to Baja. Those are fun events. They're just not the same. is a nickname for an area in Johnson Valley. Johnson Valley, California, it's um, north of Palm Springs, 29 Palms, kind of nestled on the back of Big Bear. I grew up in the 90s going to Johnson Valley and wheeling the Hammers trails. But we would wheel one trail in a day. Now we wheel 39 in a day. The Hammers is a nickname for this area in Johnson Valley. And those nicknames kind of stuck. It was neat where these people, you know, just like just like rock crawling where I come from, whoever got to break the trails got to name the trails. And this hammer theme kind of started sticking. So you have sledgehammer, jackhammer, wrecking ball, dead blow, I mean, you name it. There's uh, all the, just about every trail out there is named after a hammer trail. And it's, they consider it the high desert. And it's a really neat area as far as, again, terrain. You kind of have that, that really deserty terrain mixed with these mountains that have been getting changed for millions of years, earthquakes, oceans, who knows what was there before us, but. And uh, they've just grown it into a spectacle that lasts for approximately nine days. I mean, they'll get 100,000 people out there. It's, it turns into a city out there. I mean, you can, have, you can have parts made out there if you need to. I mean, they've got laser cutters, they've got CNC machines, they've got everything you, you you can't even imagine the stuff that they've got out there, but it's it's a city, it's a town of its own, and it's all based around racing. Pure adrenaline, horsepower, race fuel, dust, glory, triumph, but also disappointment, pain, suffering, and uh, it's just an awesome event. Pissed off, I just ripped it out. There, but it was short lived. He broke once again. So tough break for him. Swapping transmissions. Take a break. Wait! Months before the 2022 King of the Hammers, teams from all over the country prepare their race cars for the most difficult one day off road event in the world. Shop owners, mechanics, enthusiasts, men and women prepare their cars and themselves in a matter of weeks. This is their story. kid in the back of English class reading four-wheel drive magazines and the teacher just left me alone because at least I was reading. So we tear the car down completely at this time. We blow it all apart. We pull the motor, we pull the tranny, we pull the transfer case, we pull all the differentials, we go through everything on the car to make sure that it's 100% tip top ready for King of the Hammers because it's the most challenging race of the season. I mean, prep goes everything from, from axles. I mean, like for instance, we were prepping the car just yesterday 
and something that w it was just going to be a, a fix a broken stud on the rear differential. Saw that and we we're like, all right, well, we better pull the front differential as well. Check that. So it's every, I mean, and it's like that every season. You know, you get into something that you think is just going to be minor maintenance and everything just kind of snowballs from there. And, you know, car ends up tore down way further than you think it's going to be. And then you start looking at your timeline. It's like, well, you know, we're a few weeks from going to hammers. Is this going to be done or not? And, It's, it's always a, a mixed battle. You can you can prep everything you want, and there's just stuff that you can't prepare for. Last year, uh, broken valve spring is what took us out. We limped it as long as as far as we could until we destroyed the engine in it. Um, we we led the first half of the race. We were in second place by an hour for a long ways, and, and you know when the motor gave up 30 miles from the finish. So the, the normal season ends in October. Um, we didn't go to nationals in Oklahoma this year. We ended in Crandon in September. Um, and then we immediately come home and start tearing things apart. It, you know, especially with all of the challenges of supply chain issues and stuff this year, we didn't want to be, we are, but we didn't want to be thrashing at the last minute trying to get everything together. So we came home and tore the car apart and got our shocks out for service. And we found a, a split in the rear differential casting. Um, we, had, we had a couple of other major things to get repaired, so we got on that stuff right away. Now we're down to our, our normal maintenance and prep and stuff like that, replacing bolts and joints and tune parts and fluids, and we're, we're down to the, the easier stuff for sure. But yeah, it, it starts as soon as we're done racing in October, um, getting parts lined up, getting the transmissions gone through, getting all the spares lined up. It, it's, it's a non-stop thing, and here we are less than three weeks from the time we leave and we still got a lot to do to get the thing together and be ready but we're, we're in good shape though. What year did you say that before? 97? 99. So we cater to any four-wheel drive type vehicle. Uh, we do gears, we do lockers, we do suspension lifts, we do wheels and tires, but you know, we also do anything drivetrain related. First and foremost is the shop. If the shop's not operating at full capacity, we probably couldn't afford to race. I drive to the race shop, which is at Jeremy's house, and uh, usually from about six to eight, usually about two hours a day, I'll work on the car. But it's definitely a little bit stressful when you know you have a limited time to go and strip a car down completely to the bare chassis and put it back together. And the biggest hurdle I feel like that we come across is definitely going to be time you know and money obviously but it's when we don't think that we're going to have a problem with that third member or that transfer case or that engine or the steering box or any of the, you know electronic components when we go to put the car back together and we realize hey we do have a problem and now we're almost out of time so you know especially now you know in the 2020 2021 you know the supply and demand and the supply chain the product uh, availability has definitely been limited so i feel like we've put a lot more planning into getting the parts ordered earlier trying to get things here and do inspections earlier than we have in the past uh, like when we got back from oklahoma in october we raced there i believe october 15th we had the car completely disassembled before November 1st. And we wanted to do that solely based on the fact that we didn't know what parts we were gonna need. We didn't know how long they were gonna take to get here. And we wanted to be 100% competitive when we go back for KOH 2022. car that I've been racing for about five years. This is uh, my third one, two, yeah, this would be my third ultra car. And, and I was kind of thinking about getting back into the straight axle thing. Straight axle technology really, really grew while I was in the IFS car. We picked this up, so it's very new to us. 
So this is this is kind of our first run in. We got the car in pieces. I said, you know, for the most part, it was a roller, but it didn't have a motor really. And like, there were some things missing. And so we knew there'd be a lot of work. So we're starting that assembly process. So this is kind of the first time we have, we put a motor in this chassis. So we're learning, but we got the motor dropped in today, got the tranny bolted to it. We decided to halt on the Atlas. Um, I, I, I kind of run two different cases based on the race. And the one I have here isn't my, my go-to. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait, I have one on order and you know, like everything else in the world, just taking a while. We're going to start assembling the axles and, and go over and get this thing up and running and start getting it out there to test. I hate saying it because I feel I feel bad, you know, cause, but at the same time, this is all part of the schedule. All right, we're right on track. We're, we're, we're pumped. We're stoked. Like, everything's falling together, just like it, it always does in January. Right? For us, we're right on schedule. Uh, I'm not, I don't anticipate any major hiccups at this point. Just, you know, stick to our playbook and we're going to, we're going to get the hammers and hopefully kick some ass. Our corner panel, same thing. <clears throat> New front lower light amber. There's no light up there. Not up there. I know there's old wire harness that goes to that back panel. You know, I bet it was. That's what it was. I bet you it was like two brakes and an amber or something. We got intercom. We did that. Second antenna. Are we going to mount another antenna? Screw goes. Huh? There's your tool, but where's the other screw? Uh, Billy built a brand new car last year in 2021. Um, seven days before the race, I had a powder-coated chassis, that's all I had. So <laughs> we kind of slapped it together in order to get ready for hammers just because we were building that car. Like COVID kind of threw things off and I should have been building it way before and that's all on me. So this year we're not doing as much. Last year we only raced uh, four races instead of the 11 that we normally race. So we kind of took, I took some time to make sure that the team was cohesive and make sure that the car was ready for this season and uh, that, so I'm excited about that. So got the motor back in, we got the tranny back in, we got the transfer case back in, rear axle's done, front axle still be wor being worked on. I'm gonna change the steering components on that. I wanted to move the pedals forward an inch and to do that, you have kind of a little bit of a mess um, because where the headers are, where the engine sits, you kind of have to reconfigure all that. That makes it kind of a little bit more difficult than you think it is kind of on these cars, they're so packed together, five pounds of stuff in a two pound bag, you know? So it's, you move one thing and you move all of them. So uh, I'm gonna have to cut the header tomorrow, um, finish welding in where I want the pedals and then rebuild the floor. That's our goal for tomorrow. Um, and then we'll be working on getting the front axle rebuilt. And then we work on tuning the suspension. And then the last thing we do is uh, all the paint and body work, if you will. It's all fiberglass now, so I gotta make a new hood, new front fenders. I've run Bronco fenders for so long now that I can't not run Bronco fenders. I kind of have a crowd, so. built the car were too close to me so my knees were bent all the time and now we're, we've extended them out an inch but anytime you make big changes like that it's kind of a catastrophic effect so pedals move forward headers all in the way everything getting hot down there anyway so we're trying to redesign all that and get it to work a little better so we're using our computer aided drafting our CAD cardboard aided drafting and that's uh, making sure the panel is going to work for us yeah, it's the same so the brake hits. Which is why he brakes. Yeah, so what we, we don't just made just do like yeah. is cut it and build a little so cubby for it. So we just tons of room out here. You know? Okay. I think, like, you know, even if we can only get a half an inch forward, I think we'll be better off. Switching to a six piston bridge to go with calipers. Hoping that we have brakes that last more than like a couple hours because I'm pretty much used to driving with like no brakes. Over the years, I've had the same brake systems and they always, the oil boils over pretty quick. So our big upgrade for the year this year is the brake system. Um, 
that's pretty much it on the big stuff. All the small stuff is going to be like bigger GPS or changing the dash configuration and putting a dead pedal in. So. When I turned, I think 18 or 19, we started building buggies, like full chassis buggies in my parents' garage. Uh, it would be me and Keith Northrop from Northrop Fab. At the time, we would fab up stuff in the garage and build some cool things, and we'd build cages for Toyotas, we'd build full buggies, and we knew that we wouldn't be able to get into the sport and fab for people unless we could prove it, so we built a couple buggies in the garage. That evolved into us, like, let's go out and go do some of these rock crawling competitions, which is a complete mistake because the car we built wasn't good enough to be a rock crawler, and I still competed for a couple years in it as a rock crawler, so I rolled a lot, it just wasn't correct. We were sponsored by Master Pole at the time, and they told us about King of the Hammers. They're like, it's a new race, this is what it is, it's down in Johnson Valley, if you go down there, we'll pay your entry fee. And at the time, it was, I think, less than $400 to enter the Hammers. So we, me and all my wheeling buddies, drove down to Southern California in our quasi ultra four car, camped out. At the time, there was no designated camp spots. You just kind of showed up, camp wherever you want to camp. We ended up camping like on the racetrack. And so like day before the race, they're like, you need to move your whole camp. This is the start finish line. It wasn't designated, it wasn't roped off at the time. Moved our whole camp. We all slept in one RV. There was like 11 of us in an RV. We had no idea what we were getting into. We made it 40 miles, I think, that year, and engine overheated like four times in that 40 miles and realized that our car was not good for this. But we were hooked. You always gotta constantly check in for things that could possibly break. If they do, have the chance of breaking, you need to replace it before the race. There's a lot of race car prep involved. I have a lot of guys that come down and are constantly wrenching on the car, making sure everything is perfect. In order to finish this race, the car has to be near perfect. Any kind of failure out there, there's no way to get parts out there for big failures. You're, you're done, you're done for the day. That, that whole two weeks you took off and the whole two months you spent prepping the car is over. So it's very important to make sure the car is in perfect condition. Um, especially as you start running out of time and you're sitting there watching the calendar and knowing you know I'm gonna I'm leaving in two weeks or I'm leaving in a week and you know you walk out to the shop and look at the car and it's like holy crap the car's still in a million pieces and I, parts are on back order and it's like a parts gonna be here in time and you know it's I've had times where I actually I'll start calling other guys I race with asking them like hey do you have these parts in stock by chance because I've got parts on order but they're not gonna be here and no, I've, everything always ends up working out one way or another, but um, it's it's definitely stressful. It's not just stressful for me, it's stressful for the family, it's stressful for the entire pit crew. You know, everyone's kind of on edge, you know, something, a goal that we've worked towards the entire year. Um, like I said, the Super Bowl of off-road racing, you finally get to go and show up to the biggest race of the year and improve yourself. And it's, uh, you know, I've got, December's a, a rough month for me because I've got two kids' birthdays and then we got Christmas and then we got New Year. So it's it's hard for me to keep the momentum rolling on prepping the car specifically in December. Um, but but we do it, you know, my family's all in on it. My my kids love it. My kids my daughter drew me a picture the other day of hammers of a of a truck going over rocks and it says King of the Hammers on one side and you flip the paper over and on the other side it says I love King of the Hammers. 
So, you know, it's, it's nice to know the whole family's into it. The family, kids love it. My wife loves it. Um, and it makes it all worth it at the end. You know, it's, it's stressful. It's definitely stressful leading up to it, but it's like, once you're there, it just, being there you feel accomplished it's it's just an amazing feeling just you know taking the green flag knowing hey i'm starting the biggest off-road race in the world i just took a green flag at the biggest off-road race in the world is amazing I bought my first four-wheel drive. It was a K5 Blazer. When I was 10, I got a 61 Bug from my grandpa that I tore down all by myself, but I was like super pissed because I couldn't pick the engine up out of it. And I had to get my uncle to help me. Me and my dad actually out on the weekends. We were looking for things to do, and he actually bought an 86 Toyota 4Runner. I bought an 85 Toyota pickup that my dad helped me build up. I actually moved to Arizona because this is where I used to read about, you know, and this is where all the hot rock crawling was. I came out of the rock crawling world. As I got older, my brother moved on to a Jeep, and I actually bought his 4Runner off him um, and I've been wheeling that since high school. So when I was 15 years old, I had an 84 Bronco 2. And by the time I was 16, I had straight axle swapped it. I put a 302 in it, cut the roof off it, caged it, and I was driving to school every day. You know, moved into a couple other things. I did a Cadillac. I, I got into off-roading and, and jeeping recreationally just, just for fun, you know, 20 years ago. I started getting into muscle cars. So after work, I worked four to midnight. Me and my buddies got in this thing at midnight and went back roading, and I was immediately hooked in the off-road scene. This was all before I could even drive. I got my license at 13. Went out wheeling on the trails up in Big Bear where we lived at the time, and ended up, you know, rolling it and doing all the dumb things we did. I was probably three or four at the time. Uh, I had a 72 Malibu, and um, it doesn't do too well in the snow with a 454 and a boss blower. It didn't do too well at all. Uh, it wasn't long after uh, that night, I had seeked out the local four-wheel drive clubs, signed up to be a member, started going on trail rides, uh, experienced, you know, the off-road life that I never really experienced before. It got even more hooked uh, when I started meeting a lot more like-minded people. So we started racing at Jeep Speed because it was what we knew how to work on, right? So we knew how to work on Jeeps, a couple buddies of mine, and, and that transition, Ultra 4 was kind of up and coming at the time, and uh, a buddy of mine back then wanted to go short course racing, and it, not that it was boring, but it just wasn't for me. I liked the adventure of being off-road. I like traveling with your buddies, seeing new places, and uh, as that was happening, Ultra 4 was coming up, and that really grabbed my attention. It was kind of the mixed martial arts. We were able to go fast through the desert and rock crawl and start building an Ultra 4 car jumped on the internet and looked up Marlin Crawler and they had this event coming up and it was like six months out and I called my cousin up and my cousin came out and we completely tore my 85 down to the bare frame and started building it up going off of what we read on the Pirate 4x4 forum and on the Marlin forum and kind of went off of what we were reading online built this truck up and um, yeah we went out to the Marlin Crawler roundup in 2004 and and I've been hooked on wheeling ever since. Started competing locally in the local events. Uh, started my own four-wheel drive club. When we started our own four-wheel drive club, we got hooked up with a few vendors that were uh, giving us discounts on parts. So as we, the club grew and we were able to get more discounts on more parts, then it just kind of turned into a business where I'd make two or three dollars off of this toe strap or five or ten dollars off of this winch or whatever to actually help pay the club fees and the dues and pay for the place that we were meeting on a monthly basis and stuff like that and that basically just turned into a business. Uh, I've owned my shop here now for 25 years so we were general auto repair over the years we've transitioned more into off-road stuff as well so we do everything from full service auto repair to, to building up Jeeps and stuff so it's my it's my business, it's my hobby, it's all of it. Um, a decade ago, we got invited to go to King of the Hammers with uh, John Herrick and Larry Nichol Crawl Magazine, and I was pit crew on Ian Johnson's Ultra 4 car. So that was my first visit to the Hammers. Um, crewed for them that year. I pit crewed for John Herrick and Larry Nichol when they raced for a couple of years. And then, you know, we went down and spectated and the, the the seed was planted for sure. Um, 
This will be our sixth year racing King of the Hammers, so shortly before that I got the bug to, to get up and go racing. And uh, it's always more cost effective and time effective to buy somebody's car versus build your own. So I went shopping and ended up buying Jordan Townsend's old 4500 car because he was moving up to 4400. And, uh, and that was six years ago, and we've been racing it ever since and, and upgrading and maintaining and, and just having a blast with it. I got into a, a Bronco chassis back in the day um, and threw a Ford Ranger body on it and made a good wheeler out of it. And that was when I was in high school and just kind of kept beating on that and really learning how to drive and, and do off-road and, and wheel. Um, and then, you know, after high school, I joined the Marine Corps and didn't have a ton of time for it, but every time I was coming home, I was in that truck or in a different truck, and we were out wheeling, exploring Moab, exploring Utah, and, and that was kind of my go-to place. I'd come home on leave and, and just kind of do what I loved doing was being out in nature and being in the environment and, uh, you know, really start taking it to extreme. So then we started getting into rock crawling and late 90s was when uh, ARCA came out and that was when we started doing rock crawling professionally. Um, did my first competition in Southern Utah, Cedar City, um, and we had a great time. It was a blast. King of the Hammers came around and it was uh, invite only and we had been in the scene long enough that we got an invite and they said, come out and race. And we went out and raced and we worked with a real good friend of mine, Clay Egan, and uh, got him through the first King of the Hammers. And that was a blast. We had a really good time. And so then we kind of started converting my car into, a, into an Ultra 4 car, but it wasn't Ultra 4 back then. It was King of the Hammers and that was kind of what it was. And, you know, it was run what you brung. It was a pile of junk and everybody knew it. And you'd run out in the desert, lose half your shit, break it as fast as you could and come back and drink beer. And, and so it kind of evolved from there. And now we're, you know, just having a great time and, and racing every year. And, and uh, you know, we involved it into a business as well. I mean, like I've been building cars for a long time and, um, you know, my specialty is classic Broncos. And so of course I've always had a Bronco as a race car. But, you know, we, we build classic Broncos here in my shop, and that's, that's our specialty uh, and, and, you know, kind of how I love, love the adventure of it. KOH 2020, um, weeks before KOH, I had a, a, a really bad car accident. It um, messed me up bad. I mean, I had a collapsed lung, internal bleeding, uh, torn pectoral muscle, and Doctors told me they're like, there's absolutely no way you, you can't be in a race car. You can't even, you can barely get into a car. They're like, you're not racing. Forget about it. I was like, it's not happening. I was like, I have to race. Like I've, I've worked way too hard, put way too much effort into getting here. I'm not getting this up right now. They're like, you're done. You know, forget about it. You're, you're not getting back in the car. And you know, it, it, the more I heard them tell me you can't do it, the more it made me want to do it. And I, you know, went and finally I, I talked to a, a chiropractor and he was like, you know, he's like, I, I think I could help. I can at least get you moving to where you can function correctly. And I went to the chiropractor every single day for almost three weeks straight, literally leading up to the day I left for Hammers. I went to the chiropractor and doing all kinds of different therapy and it got to where, and I, I was real hesitant on even using my one of my arms up until then. And coming up to the day of hammers, and I, I asked, I asked one of the doctors I was seeing, you know, am I going to be able to use my arm to pick myself up to get up into the car? And he's like, well, the only one way to find out, and he had a pull-up bar in his office, and he could walk over to the bar and see if he can pick yourself up. And walked over, and I mean, it hurt like crazy, but I was able to pick myself up and. You know, we showed up to Hammers, and I had, I had people tell me, I had even friends tell me, you should be doing this, and <laughs> I have to do it, you know, it, it's, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not giving up, you know, I, physically I know what I can and can't do, and I, you know, yeah, it was a pain, but, you know, but working up to that point, I just, I knew I had to do it, you know, not just for sponsors, not for anyone else, but for myself, I just, you know, I had to do it. I had to prove to myself that I could do it. I did, and we finished, and we actually finished in a pretty good spot. 
made it all worth it. After months of preparation, vehicles and teams arrive at the Hammers. Over 500 teams in 20 classes converge on this hallowed lake bed to test their machines, their teams, and themselves. All for the chance to become king. Only a handful will finish, yet everyone gives their all. in and you get your armbands and you get your pit spot and you unload your car start to look around and Hammerstown starts to grow you can't get in and out of the parking spot that you were in the, it went from a thousand people to ten thousand people in a day and you know tomorrow is going to be twenty thousand people so it's just insane how fast nothing becomes a huge city we already moved out to the lake bed it's already hammer time. And uh, this is the new Bronco behind us. We uh, partnered with Ford Performance and Bronco, obviously. Um, and they help us put together an amazing car. And it's been really flawless up to this point, but we have about 50 miles on it. <laughs> so not a whole lot of test and tune time, but it, they gave it to us really good to go. Um, we still, you know, have to figure out all the nut and bolts just because it's a completely new car to us figure out the best way to pit and all the all the detail stuff that we still haven't quite figured out yet but we have about a week to figure it out and we'll get it done when we go to the king hammers we usually go about a week to week and a half before it actually any events start uh, we show up on the lake bed it takes a day and a half to set up camp our pits we have a full garage down there we have to load all of our tools all of our parts we put them in the garage we organize all of our gear that's the first couple days. Then they usually release the course map. And at that point, we're, during the day, we're out pre-running trails. Each lap is slightly different. So there's different offshoots you have to take by the laps. So we're going out there and figuring out, okay, on this lap two, we have to turn here. On lap three, we turn here. You have to learn all those things because when you're during the race, you do have a GPS to follow, but things are coming so fast and it's on adrenaline. So you really need to have it in your head where I'm going this is where I'm gonna do this, get in the rocks, I need to know where I'm gonna go. In the evening times, we're thrashing on the race car. We have to make sure the race car is in perfect condition. We'll go out and test the car, we'll bring it back to the shop, tear it down, check everything, go back out the next time, test it out, bring it back, tear it down, check everything. It's just like a, no matter how perfect you think the car is before you get to the hammers, always something happens. If you think that your car is like 100% when you hit the lake bed, then it's going to break. This is the bolt. I'm going to stop. Okay. No longer had reverse in the transmission, only forward gears. So, drop the pan, look inside. There's a few little metal pieces here and there. Swapping transmissions. Take a break. I think we're doing it about record time now. The old one's out, the new one's in. We're just trying to get all the mounts to line up again and tight bolts. And, uh, yeah. Everybody's in good spirits, having some hiccups on the on the race car. Uh, mainly with engine tuning, uh, but we kind of figured that was going to be a problem. Uh, and we would, we would work that out out here, but we found some surprise stuff. The torque converter didn't seem right, a brand new torque converter. So, you know, sometimes that happens. We don't have a whole lot of testing time on it. So they, uh, they found some issues there and that developed into some other problems. Um, some of the oilers weren't running right. There's, there's some, some issues, not, not due to maybe shortcutting, but product and supply issues right now. Uh, I know that the valve body 
that we put in was not the ideal one we wanted, but we figured it'd be good enough and it seemed to cause some problems. So they got a tire transmission out yesterday. Uh, luckily we were able to get some parts, get that thing rebuilt. And then, uh, like I said, it went back together last night and it still needs to get down for one more dyno session. So I'm gonna pull this out and grab some gas. We were out running the rocks pretty hard yesterday, so I'm sure she's pretty low too. And uh, yeah. Once you see it and hear it and smell it, you just get hooked. And um, we started coming to King of the Hammers. Will invited me out. His family's been out here uh, for many years. Um, Matt Peterson's a good friend of his family, and he's been racing. Uh, he raced 4600 for a really long time. He was a KOH winner um, in the EMC class. So um, following in his footsteps and uh, his family's uh, involvement in King of the Hammers, it was a no-brainer for us to come out here and start um, playing with cameras and shooting media and then once we had the opportunity to build a car we just jumped on it. Yeah. No, we can pull it out. I think we should run it to see if it feels super weird. I'm not even plugged in yet. round out and have that target on my back all day long but I think the course might get tore up a little bit as the day goes on so who knows it's going well no issues we've been out free running haven't tore shit up too much but uh we're ready for qualifying I want that top spot again like we had last year I think I'm, I'm more nervous to go qualify than I am to go race. When I sit there at qualifier, I know that this next two minutes, I have to be on point, 100%, no mistakes.
line was a little rough. We had like, we, the race car, we were waiting on shocks for the race car. They were getting rebuilt. Um, the shocks showed up. I can't remember what we were doing on the race car, but there was something we had to fix on it. So we were pre-running the course in the rock crawler, which is nothing close to what it is in the race car. The race car is a million times faster. We had a route we wanted to do. We knew it would be a fast route in the race car if we could get it. We had a really fast start. We were cruising super good, flawless. We get to the rock face and I just got a little too excited. I knew exactly what I needed to do. I had, when I knew I hit the waterfall, I needed to coax into it. And as soon as the front tires came back on the ground after bumping the wall, I needed to accelerate and I accelerated just a little bit too early. The car did a little wheelie, landed all four tires and just burnt out on the rocks and we lost traction. We lost about 10 seconds right there. We made up for it at the end. But we didn't qualify as high as we wanted to be. I, I was hoping for a top 10 qualifier and we were 35th or something like that, which is still fine. We we're 17th off the line, but it wasn't what we wanted. So to tell you the truth, I was pretty pissed. I was pissed at myself that I screwed up and I, it took me the rest of the night to just, you know, I'm not like throwing anything, but I was just pissed at myself. I was mad. I just needed some silence. I needed some time to like regroup. And that's what's great, how you qualify earlier in the week, then we raced at the end of the week. Gave me time to just shut myself up. It was, I was angry that I messed up, but that happens. And you just gotta deal with it. I mean, it's the same in the race. When you screw up, you can be pissed off during the race, but you need to just chill and get back to normal so you don't make another mistake. Everyone just said, hey, we did, my whole team was stoked on our qualifying. It was good enough. Um, it definitely hurt us because the dust on the first lap, but we were fine. We were, we were good. By race day, I was, I was ready to go. The last couple years, I've rented actually a house uh, outside of town. And the day before I race, I'll go out. I just go out and take a shower and I turn the TV on. I just like something to just turn it off, clear head. I wake up early in the morning, head out to the track. I'm just ready to go at that point. It's like the, the madness of the hammers is shut down when I leave and I come back, I feel refreshed and ready to race. I just need something to just reset and that's perfect for me. Tonight, the things that are running through my mind is all the issues we've had on the car prior, all the things that we've missed the night before races before, um, making sure that we hit every nut and bolt that's extremely important to the car surviving the race, um, and just double, triple checking everything to make sure we have all our bases covered for tomorrow. Um, and also just running through the course in our head, 
Um, we've ran as much of the course as we can. Uh, it's hard to hit all of it while you're out here, especially when you're trying not to beat your car up too much. Um, to do it twice is uh, asking a lot of the vehicles, so you can only run so much in the vehicle. Um, some of it you have to walk and just check it out because uh, it's going to be gnarly. Realistically, the night before the race, I'm going through the race course. It's in my mind, and that's what I'm core. That's what I'm tracking is, you know, what's my turns coming up? What's coming up? Where am I at at mile 15? Where am I at at this time? What's our pit looking like? Where's all this stuff? And that's all going through my mind. The night before the race, the team's almost always thrashing because there's never enough time to get everything done. No matter how prepared we are, there's always something. Like we've come out with perfect cars. Like I think this might be the best prep car we've ever had. And then we're still gonna be working till, you know, 11 o'clock the night before the race, just because it's a race car and that's what happens. There's always gonna be something. When I show up to the start line, Everything I've done, I've done as much as I can do until that point. And now it's time to just turn it on and let's get this done. If that, what, what was done is done at this point. So it's time to race. up the line and we go visor down it's a hundred percent concentration it's a hundred percent focus everything kind of slows down and everything's good in the world don't overdrive it don't screw up the car you know we, we've been planning on this for months we've got tens of thousands of dollars invested don't screw up and plan it on the first jump once the helmet's on and everything else outside is shut off to you and it's just you and your co-driver and we roll up and we're just like hey we have a game plan let's do this and you're sitting there you're shaky and you you know you're, you're struggling to talk you're focused on breathing and then all of a sudden you drop that visor and the guy's sitting there giving you the countdown and you're like you're fixed to this person like oh no this is about to happen it's definitely tunnel vision and it's you kind of forget about all the prep you put into it i'm gonna knock your dick in the dirt if i can about the car a lot of times because I'm thinking about the race course. That's my co-driver's job. I expect him to do his job. He expects me to do the job. My job is to get us from point A to point B as fast as possible without dying. You know, everything, all the prep, every, I mean, all the hardship, everything has got you to that point. Takes the back seat, you know, focus on racing.
people always ask, what's it like to drive an Ultra 4 car? And it's a very miserable experience, right? It's like you're going through rush hour traffic through a, you know, rush hour traffic with a complete blizzard with a bunch of pissed off people on a Monday morning and you're in a washing machine. The past six years that I've been doing this now, it's it's been an, an amazing adventure. You know, I've, I've made a lot of great friends. Um, a lot of people I, I don't even consider family at this point. I, I like driving fast. Uh, I got in trouble a lot in my younger years doing it on the street. So doing it off road just seemed to make a lot of sense. And uh, it, it is, it's just, I just have a blast doing it and, and going road racing or drag racing or any of that stuff just never really appealed to me. I've always been an off-roader. I've always been a Jeeper and driving fast off-road over stuff is just a good time. Racing is 100% a drug, I would say. And you know, if you ever talk to my dad out here, he, uh, he considers himself a drug dealer with deals adrenaline. But uh, it uh, definitely probably not the best habit to have, but I got it pretty bad and it's it's definitely my passion you know even like I was talking about earlier the people out here really make it special and make it an amazing experience and getting to strap into a car you know that has 700 horsepower and rip through the desert is it's an experience that isn't almost as hard to explain the adrenaline of being in a race situation it's once once you get strapped into the car and you're sitting on the start line there's no feeling that compares to it. Your adrenaline spikes, uh, you get totally zoned in on the race, and it's just you, your co-driver, the car, and the team behind you, and it's just a really awesome, exhilarating feeling to, to go through this whole endeavor. And even just packing for a race and driving out, trailering everything out, the whole process is just extremely fun. I look forward to it every time. Um, and it's also introduced us to, to some amazing people. For me to be able to build a team that we can accomplish these great things, that's that's where I get my enjoyment, you know? And yeah, I'm a race car driver and I love doing that. And I love being out there in the battle. I love to fight with other guys on the course. I love that. But I know I've got a good team behind me. I wouldn't enjoy it if I didn't have a good team behind me. I wouldn't have fun if I knew those guys weren't there supporting me. It wouldn't be enjoyment if I was just out there by myself. If I, I mean, if I wanted to do that, I could just go do whatever I wanted to do, you know, and that's, that's not me. I want, I love the fact that I can make everybody have a good time doing this race, you know, and competing in King of the Hammers and that, and it's not just King of the Hammers, it's building this race car. I'm mean, so proud of these guys from last year because we worked our ass off just to get that car to the race. We worked hard. I mean, we, we had a bare chassis seven days before the race. Nobody, everybody, that saw it was like, how in the hell are you gonna get that done? And it was cool because I was like, I mean, it, it, just, it was just a group of guys with skills, All everybody has great skills, but you just gotta put them in the right places and make sure they do the right things to make the, make the job happen. was the smoothest King of the Hammers I think I've ever had. First lap was miserable. Uh, we were, since we started 17th row, all the guys ahead of us had created so much dust because it was so dry out there. It was super silky. I could only see five feet in front of my bumper for the first 40 miles of lap one. 
and we were just driving by GPS. It was super scary, probably going 40 miles an hour. You hit a bomb hole, you hit a bush, you hit a rock, a stick can go on the side of the tire and pop your tire. My co-driver was just focusing on the GPS and he's like, we were five feet off, go to the left, go to the right. And that's all we we're doing was we were keeping a safe pace that we could do. And when the clouds of dust calmed, we would just floor it in those sections and go as fast as we could until we hit the next set of clouds of dust. That was lap one at main pit. I have an awesome team of guys that help me out the main pit. I think we were in and out in like two or three minutes. They put 40 gallons of fuel in the car in 26 seconds on our fuel tower. So it's super quick, in and out, spot check. Go out for lap two. Lap two, I knew the course. I was like, this is, lap two felt like it was five minutes long. And you know, it still took us 40 minutes or 35 minutes or whatever it was but it felt like five minutes because I knew where I was going. I knew exactly everywhere I needed to go. It was super smooth, no problems, super cool. At the end of lap three, we come out of the rock trails, the last of the rock trails. I think it's 15 miles of desert before you get to resolution. And as soon as we come out of the rock trails, the helicopter starts falling on us and you know when the helicopter is falling you that you're doing pretty good. So from that point, they followed us from when we got out of the rocks all the way to the finish line. And we were just cruising, we were smashing. It was like, we must be doing all right, so we need to go faster. So we were just smashing through the desert. Everything felt good. It was beat. You know, the, you knew the car was beat. You could feel it. It was making noises, and it was rough. The shocks were hot, so it was bottoming out. It was. We knew the car was beat down, but at the same time, I was like, man, we're, we're cruising. Like, let's get this done and get, get make up as much time as we can now. If we get a flat, we get a flat. Screw it, we're gonna drive on a flat, whatever. So at that time, we just turned it on. At the end of lap three, we just smashed the finish line and got done in daylight. And for us, for years, we just finished in nighttime. In the last two years, we finished with the sun up, daylight, huge accomplishment for our team. So we were super stoked to be one of the first people to show up. Daylight, everybody's there, everyone's stoked. We killed it. You're so tight and so focused all day long and you know you're getting close to the finish line and you just like relax. Your whole body just like relaxes. Your mind relaxes and it's just, you're cruising at that point. Then it's like, it's like this, it's a weird feeling inside where you're just, it's like super stressed all day and super tight. And then all of a sudden you're just, I'm gonna finish this race. Hammer, I've raced hammers a lot and we've finished very few times and it's it's awesome to feel that you know like you don't feel it at the finish line you feel it like five miles out you know you're like all right we got this I've got this finish this is awesome and you and the co-driver are experiencing that and then you get to the checkered and you're like yeah we did it and it's awesome and it's great and then you get your team there and it's like yeah this is cool, this is really great. You have the whole team up on the podium with you and it's that, that, that accomplishment, you know? It's like, we just did this huge race that out of 400 drivers, there's 30 that finished, you know, or, or less. And it's, just, it's amazing to, to do that, you know? And, and to, get, to get that experience, you just kind of have that, I'm not one of those guys that kind of blows off, you know, and jumps up and down and sings a tune or anything like that. But you feel that way. You feel like this is an amazing thing. This is great for all of us to experience. And, and I, I, I wouldn't want any other team. Good job, Bailey. Look fun. <laughs> Slowly just picking away at everybody, which is good. Right. Yeah, I was trying to keep a pace.
ran our pace, right, to back in a solid axle car, so I wanted to attack the rocks hard and kind of cruise control through the desert, and that was our game plan. Stay. 